you very much, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see, and as you know, I've been asked to talk about what gorillas can teach us humans, lessons from the wild and from captivity. You will have heard some uh, comments from Anthony Chadwick about the back... Uh, uh, the backwoods of, of, of Cambridge were actually hiding to get away from Anthony Chadwick in a tiny cottage in Norfolk. Uh, this, though, is a nice ch change because so often, as you see from this slide, the Coopers, Margaret, my wife, and myself are migrating, living in other countries. It's nice to be back in Britain and to be part of this very exciting virtual congress. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Anthony, the, the, the founder of the webinar vet, and indeed all his team, uh, for all they've done in the past, but also for this fantastic Congress today, and it really is an honor to take part in it. Um, I also want to thank my wife, Margaret, to whom uh, Anthony has alluded, who's not only accompanied and supported me in adventures all over the world, including Africa, but also very ably assisted with this presentation, because I'm not as good on modern electronic devices as she is. Now, as you all know, Anthony generously offered to contribute 10% of ticket sales to guerrilla work in Uganda, Muted. to the project um, Conservation Through Public Health, which was founded and is run by veterinary surgeon Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikosoka. We all call her Dr. Gladys in Africa, and I'm going to ask Margaret, my wife, if she'd just tell you a little bit about Gladys so that you know what is being supported and why it's so important. Yes, good morning from uh, windy, windy East Anglia. Uh, we, we've known Gladys since she was a student at the Royal Veterinary College, um, and even then she was working on uh, studies um, on um, mountain gorillas in her own country. Um, since once she graduated, she went straight back to Uganda and had a place as the, the first vet uh, to be employed by the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Um, that, that sounds like the absolute dream job for a would, what would be wildlife vet, but when you consider all the facilities she was given was a chair and a desk and an empty shelf, um, she w became extremely adept at pulling in all the expertise um, to help her of all the vets who were lived, wildlife vets who were with, uh, with a lot of um, knowledge and experience who um, were working in the area, passing through living in perhaps East, Ang East Africa or South Africa. And in that way, she built up the um, veterinary policy and the veterinary services for Uganda Wildlife Authority. From there, she went to North Carolina State University to do a residency in zoological medicine, which she um, used to her full extent and got an award there as well, which supported some of her research later on. And then when she came back, she started her own uh, project called Conservation uh, Through Public Health, recognizing that the health of the mountain gorillas in the area and the, and the um, people who live in villages surrounding the, the, the forest habitat where the mountain gorillas live in the Barunga Mountains and in windy, um, um, impenetrable forest, that they're inevitably entwined. And she thought this is important to look after the health of the gorillas by checking our fecal samples when they appear uh, either in the forest or when um, they come into the fields that are um, farmed by the local people, that not only taking those samples, but also seeing to the public health and well-being of the communities in the area. And that's why in this screen you see an awful lot more people and children and cattle than you do gorillas. And that, that is what her project is doing now. <laughs> Sorry, press that on prematurely. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret. Well, today we're looking at, we're talking primarily about uh, gorillas and the implications of the close relationships, taxonomic, anatomical, and behavioral, between the two species of gorilla uh, and human beings, uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, a, a survey, a study done in 2004 said that we are only 1.6% different, Homo sapiens, and the two species of gorilla in terms of our DNA, and therefore there are bound to be some, uh, there's bound to be some significance in that in terms of what we can learn from gorillas. First point I want to make is that the great apes, of which the gorillas are one, uh, are threatened. This says the plight of the great apes, and they are threatened by many, many precious the next slide um, just depicts some of these. In our book on the left, Wildlife Forensic Investigation, that was published two years ago, um, we drew attention to the threats to wildlife, including gorillas, including primates, 
and as I say, some of them you can see on the screen. That's trapping, poaching. You can see a refugee camp in the middle there, which was built on the edge of the Barungas, the, the, the volcanoes where the uh, gorillas live. You can see it in the higher picture. Um, animals poached, etc., and they're, they're, thereby needing to be looked after in captivity, etc., etc. It is quite a chilling story. However, what we want to do, do today is to move on and talk about what, why these are important, these animals. Um, I shall emphasize, of course, gorillas, but you'll also have mention of other great apes, and indeed from time to time monkeys, because they are relevant to our story. Now, as was mentioned earlier, um, we have lived in, in East Africa in, in three different countries, um, and um, our hearts are very much there. This is Mount Kenya on the equator. Um, and our children were born in Kenya in the 1970s. And my um, contact with particularly living in East and Central Africa very much strengthened my interest and involvement in primates. Um, my uh, first exposure to African primates and indeed other species was when I first was qualified. I went out to Tanzania. I am the chap. And, uh, bottom right there showing you how not to post-mortem a baboon. Health and safety officers, please turn the other way. Um, I went out as, a, as the VSO's first veterinary volunteer and was very much involved with wildlife, including um, uh, primates. No time to discuss this in detail, but I narrowly missed examining, doing veterinary examination of the first cases of Marburg disease, uh, the vervet monkeys that were being flown through Tanzania uh, to Germany, to the uh, town of Marburg, where, of course, um, uh, over 30 people subsequently died. Uh, after my time in Tanzania, Margaret and I lived in Kenya, which we'll refer to again later, then a spell in Britain, and then back to Tanzania, and then finally went on, finally, as far as this part of the story is concerned, uh, went on to Rwanda. And there I took up the uh, position of the director of the Centre Veterinaire de Volcan, the Volcano Veterinary Centre, and you can see a range of pictures here. It was and is an idyllic spot, as you can see from the picture top left there with Sabino, the volcano, in the background. But it wasn't always terribly easy, uh, for reasons we'll explain in a minute, and even everyday living presented a, a few challenges. You'd like to see bottom centre that our computer suite, which meant running a computer that ran on torch batteries, uh, plus oil lamps for lighting. Right. So, um, so that was the situation as far as moving to Rwanda was concerned. And what was actually involved there, and this is relevant to our, our story, uh, essentially, um, the, the, the job of the center was to carry out uh, health monitoring of mountain gorillas and other wildlife, and it was minimally invasive. In other words, it was observational and collecting samples. During my three years, in, uh, my two years in uh, Rwanda, I only actually mobilized uh, three mountain gorillas. So you can see the scene here, and you can see top left there, you can see Margaret and some mountain gorillas up in the forest. Margaret's the good-looking one on the right, and the mountain gorillas are the good-looking ones on the left. So that was the everyday work, uh, going up in the forest, super work, fascinating, hard work, training local people, etc., which we enjoyed very much. I mentioned the paucity of clinical material because one doesn't actually immobilize a, a gorilla and examine it unless it's got a life-threatening condition, uh, and usually one that's been inflicted by some human agency. But there was a lot of post-mortem work to be done because gorillas died and bodies were found and so on. And you see uh, some scenes of that post-mortem work being carried out here. Uh, the bottom row of pictures and the top right actually relate to where Gladys and her colleagues work because these were four mountain gorillas that had been poached in the Bwindi Impenetrable Forest. Uh, four females had been killed, and you can see various parts of uh, features of the examination there. These had been killed, poached, uh, in order to, to steal a baby. So there was that sort of work to do, as well as the routine uh, examination or, or observation of our own gorillas. But a particular important part of the work and very, very relevant to today was building up links between gorilla, gorilla and human health. If you look at it, these pictures, all taken 20 years ago when we were there, you see the close proximity between me, top left, with a gorilla I've just immobilized and it's just waking up. See how close I am, no protective clothing at that stage. Look at the tourists on the right there. That Italian tourist is much more interested in meeting the gorilla vet than he is in the gorillas. In the meantime, the gorillas are just wandering around, wonderful to see, but coming very close to humans and vice versa. So now, of course, there are much stricter rules, and we're 
aware of how pathogens can be transmitted.